from the treasurer for the good this meeting is being recorded and this meeting is being recorded as you may have uh, seen pop up just now but uh, so i'm the treasurer for uh at least the next couple of days <laughs> um i did want to quickly introduce our new i don't know if they're all on yet but our new uh leadership team for the recruiting service five six um we've got this so this is the first i think uh stream or event that we've had since since electing our uh new new folks new leadership team and i, I saw your video there um sergeant smith so yours is working i guess Yes, ma'am. So this is the first um, event that we've had since the new election, um, and our last one as uh, as your recruiting service uh, leadership team. So uh, this is going to be a great a great event, I believe. Um, we're going to basically focus on master sergeant. The master, the last master sergeant board results, um, kind of get an out brief from that. Um, we have uh, Chief Master Sergeant Don Rosnos, who um, who was a member of that that board, uh, that panel. So she should be able to provide some insight for that. And um, I just want to thank you, Chief, for agreeing to do this for us. It's greatly appreciated. I know we've got a lot of eager tech sergeants out there looking for some answers. So uh, I just want to thank you again and welcome to this uh, Recruiting Service 5-6 uh, seminar. Um, I guess we will just get right to it if you want to uh, introduce yourself or, or get started. Um, the floor is yours, Chief. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that introduction. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, obviously I'm, I'm Chief Rosnos. I am currently the senior enlisted leader for the 343rd Recruiting Squadron. Um, I came into recruiting, oh gosh, I have to always look at my bio because I forget my own dates, um, around 2008. And uh, I did my EA recruiting in Houston and then have had a few subsequent tours from there. I did take a three-year hiatus, uh, left a recruiting service after I made senior and uh, went to Korea actually for almost three years. Um, the, the catalyst for that was just joint spouse assignment availability it was very difficult for some pro suit positions. Um, but I am a career recruiter. I just had a small, slight detour in my recruiting tour. So been in recruiting for a while, um, made most of my promotions in recruiting. So I will hopefully be able to help you understand um, when you're competing as an 8R, what type of things, you know, you can do to shore up your records or to convey how awesome you actually are. There may be some non-8Rs on this call. Um, I know that we have plenty of CSTs and personnelists and, and public affairs members in AFRS. When I say recruiters, I don't mean to exclude you. Um, I just know that the vast majority of people on this call are 8Rs, um, but I am talking about everyone. So the examples that I have here do apply even across those support AFSCs that we have. So I, I apologize if I keep saying recruiters, um, it's just easier. But what I do mean is NCOs, I mean people on the recruiting team. So I mean all of you, regardless of your AFSC, but I, I will probably focus on the eight R's since that is the, the majority of, of who most of you are. So yes, I was on the promotion board this year and I did not determine the 9% promotion rate. That was not me. Do not, do not be mad at me for that. Um, I just helped grade the records. And so I'm going to give you some insight. Even as a chief, there were many things that I didn't even know that I didn't know about how promotions were determined. Um, I'm going to go through with you in detail how the board process works. And then we're going to um, transition to some tips that I have for you. And also, I'm going to try to help explain a little bit of why in the heck we had that surprise 9% promotion rate that maybe some of us didn't see coming. Um, you know, how come maybe you had to promote now and didn't get promoted, um, various different things like that. So we're going to touch on that. That's towards the end of the briefing. You have to sit through the boring stuff to get to the good stuff. I'm just kidding. Hopefully it's not boring. Um, hopefully it's insightful. 
I know not everyone on this call is just dying to get promoted. Some people really want to get promoted and some people are super happy where they are. Even if you're super happy where you are and you're not feeling like you're after that promotion right now, you may have a subordinate at some point in time who really wants to get promoted or your outlook might change. Um, I do not expect that this information will become obsolete anytime soon. This is the way that the Air Force has been doing promotion boards for quite some time. Um, small details might change, like we might go from bullets to narrative, for example. But the overall process, um, I don't expect to see that overall process change. If you are Space Force, Space Force is doing things almost exactly the same way. They have a few slight differences, like their EPR forms. I think they're not using the promotion statements, but the board process for them is still the same. They've just mirrored the Air Force board process. Um, they may eventually deviate and come up with their own processes, but for now, it looks just the same as the Air Force board process. I am gonna share my screen. And when I share my screen, unfortunately, um, I can't see you all anymore. So if you type something into the chat, I probably won't see it. If you have a question, feel free to just pipe up and just come up, come up on comms and say your question out loud. Um, I don't mind if you interrupt me. I want this to be interactive. I will try to get through my briefing in an hour because I know for some of you on the East Coast, it's, it's go home time. Um, so I will do my best to get through it in an hour, make sure we have time for questions. I can stay for hours, but I want to respect your time. So if I'm talking too fast and you need me to slow down and clarify something, just like I said, come up on comms. And please let me know if you can't see the slides because I'm not super great at Zoom. So I, I think it's working, but if it's not working and you can't see the slides, let me know. All right. So we have, like I said, 22E7 promotion board. Um, if you happen to be a master sergeant select, or um, if you're another rank and you've joined us, just know that this is the same for senior and chief selection boards. The, you know, the numbers of eligibles might change a little bit. The things that they, you know, the, the level of performance they expect might go up. The board charge might change slightly, but the process is exactly the same for those, those other ranks as well as you progress. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the organization of the board, the board president, the oath, how we were trained once we got there, and then really how the scoring works, because that's what you all really want to know is why did I get the board score I got? So we'll talk about that. So there are five um, different, or sorry, four different areas that the promotion board is grouped into. So we're not maintenance, medical, or ops, we're support. So that's where you're going to see your records being scored are in those support panels. There were five panels. And what is really important for you to know about these panels is that there's three people on each panel. So the panels can grade anywhere from two to 27 AFSCs. So my, my personal panel, we graded almost 20 AFSCs. So I did not just grade recruiters, I graded over 20 AFSCs. And it is important for you to realize that the three people on your board are from three different AFSCs. So it's not like you have three recruiters on the board. You got me and that's it. And then you got a Colonel from some random AFSC and you got a chief, another chief from some random AFSC. It's theoretically possible that you could meet a promotion board in which you share an AFSC with zero panel members. So that's absolutely possible. You um, really want to write your records so that they can be understood by people outside of your AFSC. I know you've heard that before, but you might not have really internalized it. So, you know, I, if I were a maintenance colonel or a pilot or a surgeon, and I read a bullet about an AFRAP, I might not know what the heck an AFRAP is. And I might not know why an AFRAP matters. And then if I go and I read the acronyms, I still don't really know what it, it is. It, it's an ambassador of some sort, like the US ambassador to China. I, I might be getting really confused by this type of acronym. I might not really understand what a COI is or why it matters. Or even when I read center of influence as, as the acronym, that, that doesn't help me. I don't understand it um, if I'm not a recruiter. Um, if I'm an Intel chief, do I really understand the difference between a silver badge, a gold badge, a bronze Olympiad, a silver Olympiad, and a gold Olympiad? I mean, I don't know, probably not. I probably don't understand the difference in those things. Um, so I really want you to think about that when you write your EPRs. I want you to read the bullet and I want you to ask yourself, if I was not a recruiter, 
would I understand A, what this bullet is saying, and B, why this is important to the Air Force or why this is important to the mission. So I think that, that when you write 1206s, it is perfectly okay to use all the Air Force or Air Force Recruiting Service acronyms and talk in production speak and say NEC, AFRAP, COI, CAN, RAL, all of those things can go into a recruiting 1206 and it's gonna be read by a recruiter who's gonna understand the acronyms. They, they know what that stuff is. They understand why it's important. They know that if you have a 1% uh, in-week rate that you're beating the standard because they know what an in-week is and they know what the standard is. Um, but someone who's not a recruiter doesn't know those things. So when you have a 1206, let's just say you have this monster awesome 1206 and you win NCO of the year for AFRS. And you think to yourself, these are the best bullets ever. I just won AFRS NCO of the year. And you copy and paste all those bullets onto your EPR. It is a different audience. Those bullets don't, don't hit the same way when it's a non-recruiter or recruiter. So that's one of the things that I want you to start thinking about is as a non-recruiter, would I understand this bullet and the importance of it? You don't have to do that with 1206s because the audience is different, but you need to do it with your EPRs. Um, because like I said, you might not have a recruiter on a promotion board. Um, like any AFSC could be grading your records. Keep that in mind. Um, we were monitored while we were there, while we were grading these records on these panels um, by a board president. We had a female one star. She was our board president. So this is a, a general officer who has given up a month of her responsibilities to come and watch us. That's how serious this is. So she monitors our progress. If we're grading records too fast, she might say to us, you need to slow down. You're reading too fast. I, I wanna make sure that you're getting all the content from the records. Or if we're reading too slow um, to where our TDY would not finish on time, she may elbow us. She also stands over us really truly like watching us the whole time to make sure that we're not doing anything that we're not supposed to be doing. So we couldn't have cell phones with us, for example, in, in the boardroom. Um, it wasn't that it was classified. It was just that it's, you know, you don't want somebody taking pictures of what's going on or Googling stuff or who knows. No, no cell phones were allowed. Um, we weren't allowed to take notes that left the room. We could take notes, but we couldn't leave the room with them. It was pretty controlled. We were not allowed to talk to each other um, about the records like at all. I could not have a conversation with the person next to me with the exception of when there was a split. And I'll talk about that later. Um, we, when we were allowed to talk, we had an observer making sure that we followed the rules and we were not doing things that we weren't supposed to do. Like say, oh, I know this person and I think they're awesome. That's why I gave them such a high board score. Trust me, you should give them a high board score too. That would be totally illegal. I could not do that. And I was watched very closely while I was there to make sure that I wasn't doing things like that, that were not allowed. Um, so we had to evaluate the records based on what we saw in writing, in the records. We weren't allowed to bring our personal knowledge of the individual, if we knew them. We weren't allowed to bring our personal knowledge of the individual into the conversation um, or into the grading process. Um, so she, she was there also to do quality reviews. So after we had finished grading an AFSC, she would do a quick cursory look through the records to make sure that, you know, if, if we had gotten through, and this is just an example, this didn't really happen, but if we had gotten through a whole AFSC and we didn't promote anybody with promote nows or must promotes, but we promoted all these people with article 15s, um, there would obviously be like a reason to question that. Um, so she did a quick cursory review of our work when we were finished. So there was quite a bit of integrity. There was actually significantly more. I always thought that there was integrity in the process, but it was so much more controlled than I would have imagined. So it, it's something that I think that you should be able to rest very easy knowing how controlled this is and how much integrity there is going on in this board. It's very, very controlled. We had to take an oath. So we took an oath on the, I think it was the first day, it might've been the second day, uh, but we took an oath that we were not gonna grade the records with prejudice or partiality. So, you know, all of those things that you hear about um, you know female promotions or so, you know things like that that you hear sometimes in the rumor mill that people may have an advantage or not have an advantage. We don't consider those things when we're grading our our packages. And if we were caught considering those things, you know, either through data analytics or through our conversation being overheard, it would have it would have definitely been an issue. Um, but we also don't know those things about the people whose records we're reviewing. We don't know their gender, their religion, their marital status. 
uh, some, we don't know the race. We don't know anything like that. You can sometimes guess, you know, Jennifer's probably a female, not necessarily, but you know, if you, if you had to guess if it was a male or a female, it, you know, you might guess it was a female. So if you had some ulterior motive, like I'm going to um, promote females or I'm not going to promote females, um, that would be about the only way you could do that is guessing through their names. Um, but those checks that I was talking about where the board president is, reviews our work, those, those type of anomalies would be caught if you were to do those things. Um, and you would also cause a split if you were to do those things. And we'll, and we'll talk about it later. But rest assured, those things are not happening in your Air Force promotion boards. You're truly being evaluated on the content of your records. Um, so not only did we have to take this oath, but we had a good, a good day of being educated on what we were and were not allowed to talk about. Um, so I couldn't tell anybody that I was on the board till after the board. I wasn't allowed to give this briefing until after the promotion results came out. Um, and I never allowed to say how I graded records. So I can't say that I really valued X and I really didn't value Y. Um, the risk is that if I say that and you think that that's you know, the truth data, you may assume that that's what all the panel members did and that's what all the boards are gonna do. So I'm, I'm allowed to say you know, how the, the board, what the board looked at, but I'm not allowed to say what mattered to me or didn't matter to me. And I'm not allowed to say how I graded your records. Um, I wouldn't necessarily remember how I graded your records because I graded so many records. And to be honest, a lot of times I did not read the names. Um, so I didn't even know whose record I was grading. Um, I thought it would help me um, to not know if I was grading one of my own people's records. Um, and, I, and it didn't matter anyway because the name doesn't have anything to do with the score. So I probably don't even know how I graded your record, to be honest with you. But if I do remember, I can't tell you. Um, so we would review your NCO selection record and we would grade you based on your whole person concept, not whole airmen. So when we say whole airmen, we're generally talking about like community service, education, that type of thing. Um, when we say whole person in this context, um, we, were, we were talking about everything in your record. So duty performance being the most valuable thing. Um, and that's from the board charge. I'm not saying for me, that was the most valuable thing. That's what the board charge says is the most valuable thing. Um, so that whole airman concept really just means that I can't, as a board member, pick one thing that I'm deciding is going to determine who gets promoted. Like if you've got a Navy MSM, I'm going to promote you. And if you don't, I'm not. I can't do that. I can't just pick like one pass or fail factor and start applying that to records. I have to look at every record holistically um, in, in, and to try to be fair as much as I can based on the totality of what I see in your records. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, this is what we see when we're um, grading your records on the promotion board. It is on a computer screen. And so, you know, by the end, you know, a month in, 2,000 records in, it felt like our eyes were bleeding. Um, but it is a, it is a, it's a lot of computer work. So on the left, you've got your EPRs. So if you can see it, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can, but it says one of 12. So there's 12 pages here, which means there's six EPRs. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize is that we are looking at six EPRs for early time and grade tech sergeants. And the reason for that is when you are a staff sergeant who gets a line number and you get a tech select EPR, you get two EPRs in that year. So we are reviewing five years of EPRs, but for young time and grade tech sergeants, that actually means five, e I'm sorry, six EPRs. So some of you had a staff sergeant EPR that was being evaluated for the board. Um, I think I remember seeing some that were like staff sergeant select EPRs. So if you're, if, if this is your very first look, you may have more EPRs there than you realize. And if you think about how much you've grown since you were a staff sergeant, um, you may or may not be super happy that the promotion board is looking at a staff sergeant EPR. So this is just gee whiz information. Um, and as you supervise others, know that their staff sergeant EPRs are actually really important because they might meet the master sergeant selection board. And you're not necessarily thinking about master sergeant selection boards when you're writing a staff sergeant's EPR, but you should be just in case. Um, so of these 12 pages, um, I want you to note at the bottom, there's this little arrow. And so that's how you flip the page. Now, these are on the internet. These are not downloaded onto the desktop of the computer. They're on the internet. And so naturally, 
there could be a lag when you hit that next page button. So if I am not sharing the AFSC with you and you have a ton of acronyms that I don't understand, in order for me to understand your bullet, I have to flip back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, so that's just something to think about when you're writing your EPRs is will the board member take the time to do that? Um, they might, I'm not saying they won't, but it's just something to consider um, in case an individual on the board does not want to take the time to do that. Write your EPRs, especially those front pages, so that they're easy to understand. Um, that would be my advice to you. The second stack here is your decorations. So these are gonna be every decoration for your entire career. Um, if you stay in and you've been in 26 years and you're meeting the chief promotion board and you got a decoration as an A1C, it will be there, it will meet the board. So another thing for you to really realize is that your EPRs are not forever, but your decorations are forever. So when you are writing your decorations, do not phone it in. Write that decoration like your chief stripe depends on it because it will. Write that decoration with all of the effort and editing and time that you can possibly put into it. Put the effort into the decoration that you would have put into an EPR or more. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking, um, not necessarily for the board, but it's heartbreaking when I have a, an NCO of mine who tells me about how they were the ALS Levito or they were an Airman of the Year for a numbered Air Force and it's not in their decoration because no one will ever know that about them now, ever again. It's, it's lost information, it's lost data. You don't get the chance to tell the board like, hey, this wasn't in my deck, but I have this really amazing thing in, in my past. It's gotta get in the deck, make sure it's in the deck. So the board's gonna see every single one of your decorations if they're in product. And so you get these system generated emails all the time that say file freeze is coming up, check your records. Please check your records. Now that I have been through this experience, I know how common it is for your records to not actually be correct. Um, so please check your records. This isn't like a rare thing that happens. This is a thing that absolutely happens on a regular basis where people's records are wrong. It does not mean that you will get to meet a supplemental board if your records are wrong. You might, but you might not. So you know they're, they're gonna determine through lots of rules whether or not you get to meet the supplemental board. It is much, much better not to risk it and to check your records before you meet the promotion board. On the right, you have this thing called your DVB. It's like a SERP, but it's different. It's, it contains very, very little data compared to a SERP. So you will see here, um, I know you can't read it, but it's, that's it, that's all the information that's on it. So at the top, it has basic information about you. We can see your total active federal military service date, your time and rank. Um, we can see your number of decorations. So that's kind of what those lines are. It tells us how many comms, achievement medals, whatever you have in the, in the date of the most recent one. And it'll say like PCS or ACH. So either it's a specific achievement or a PCS. So there's a little bit of data about your, your decorations. And then there's a list of your assignments and that's it. I can't see your PME. I don't know if you've done SEJ PME one, two, and I don't know, I have no idea. I don't know if you have a CCAF or a doctorate degree. I have no idea. I cannot see that stuff. It is not on the DVB. The only place I can see that is if you put it in your EPRs. Um, so if you already finished your master's degree and you are not taking college anymore, but you want the board to know that you have a master's degree, um, you can write a bullet that says something like utilize master's degree and then however you utilized it. If you write a bullet that says I completed three classes towards my CCAF, well, I guess you wanted the board to know that you didn't have a CCAF. Um, so you decide what you wanna tell the board and you put it in your EPRs because your education is not on the DVB. So I think that's an important thing to realize that the DVB and the SURF do not look like each other. If you wanna see your DVB, you can go into Prada and pull your ASMET records if you've met a promotion board and you'll be able to see exactly what your DVB looks like. And sometimes there are mistakes on that too. So I, I would check it if I were you. And then at the bottom, that's where we input our score. Um, so you, and I'll go over this in more detail if you can't see it, but we just click like lowest or well above average. We click what we think about that person's record after we review these pages of documents. And that's it, that's how we do it. So we were told before we started grading records, 
um, to consider these whole person concept things. Um, so you'll see on here performance, competence, expertise within specialty, those, those things that are about your job. So you're supposed to consider, we're supposed to consider how well you perform in your AFSC. We're also supposed to consider your breadth of experience. So every single one of you um, that is an 8R has a special duty. Um, those of you that aren't 8Rs, you may or may not have a special duty, but you can still capture the uniqueness of working in a recruiting squadron. So it doesn't help you a ton as a recruiter because every single one of you, you're equal. Like you have that equal playing field of doing the recruiting duty special, special duty. Um, but if you return to your AFSC, your, if you RTF, um, there's data on my purse that shows how much of a higher promotion rate you historically have. And I don't have it memorized, but it's, it's significantly higher um, because you've got that breadth of experience. Um, education is one of the things we're supposed to consider. But here's the thing. Each panel member decides how important that is to them. So one panel member might think it's only a tiny bit important to me and I'm only going to care about it in like a, a tiebreaker. And another panel member might say, I, you know, I don't want anyone to be promoted if they don't have a CCAF, unless their record is just so amazing that it's undeniable. Um, and another person might care about bachelor's degrees a little bit, but not a lot. You know, so it, it really just depends on the individual person. We're told we should, we should factor in your education, but we're not told how or how much to factor in your education. Um, so that's part of why you might see your board scores change from year to year, right? Because you have three different people reviewing your records and they're from three different AFSCs and each AFSC has its own culture. So uh, they, they might be used to prioritizing different things um, or they may interpret the board charge differently. Um, so there are some things in the board charge that are pretty vague and it's up to the individual board members exactly how they're gonna interpret the board charge. Um, so I know that can be a source of frustration for some people because they're like, gosh, I just want to know what the board is looking for. The board is looking for what's in the board charge, but they, they may vary a little bit on how they apply that. The board charge is the answer. That is the key to the kingdom. If you've never had the board charger, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Um, please go onto my purse and it's like Google. There's a little search bar and you just type board charge into the search bar and they'll all come up. And what it really is, is it's the chief of the staff of the Air Force, so General Brown, telling the board, telling the promotion board, you have been charged to decide who's going to get promoted. This is what you will evaluate them on. So it is literally our instruction for how to grade your records, kept vague enough that the panel members can apply it how they see fit. As chiefs and colonels, they're trusted to do that. Um, awards, for example, those are, those are a consideration. Um, they might be like, you know, maybe somebody on the board thinks that NCO of the year and Levito are like, that's it, you're stellar, 10 points. And maybe someone else is like, you know, I don't really care about the Levito award because it doesn't apply in the workplace. So whatever, it doesn't really matter a lot to me. Um, so you, you have board members who will view this differently, but this is all what's considered. Just, just keep that in mind that that could be why your board score changes a little bit from year to year. So you've got over here, your um, scoring that you will receive from the panel. Actually, I think I can see the chats. Let me see. Oh, you guys are just chatting with each other. Cool. All right. So you can see on the scoring scale over here that you get scored six to 10 with 7.5 being average. So again, each board member is going to probably open up your record with that expectation that it's going to be average. And then as they're flipping through the pages, they're going to see things that they either really are impressed by or really don't like. And that's probably going to cause them to lower or raise your score. Um, and again, how much they lower or raise their score is up to them as an individual. But a split, if you've heard that term before, that's when the panel members don't agree. So if I open up a record and I go like, ooh, wow, this is rough. I'm going to give them a 6.5. And the panel next, next to me, who we can't talk, the panel number, member next to me thinks it's an awesome record. Um, and they want to give it an 8.5, that's a split because we're one and a half or more points away from each other. And that's too far to be away from each other. It means that we're not on the same page about this airman. And this airman deserves for us to have a conversation to determine should they get promoted or not. So when that happens, we have to, to take a pause 
and we have to discuss the record. That's the only time we're allowed to discuss the record. And we do this under supervision. So a member that works for, for the, the secretary of the Air Force board secretary, it comes over and listens to our entire conversation, like very attentively. They are completely focused on every word that we say. Um, you know, so for example, if a, if a board member were to say to me, this member has a silver badge and I don't know what that means. I could explain what a silver badge means. That's allowed. But I cannot say, oh, a silver badge is like a dime or dozen, it ain't nothing. Or a silver badge is so hard to get, it's amazing. I can't give like my opinion on the silver badge. I just need to kind of say factually what it is. So then that board member decides for themselves if it's important or not versus me influencing them if it's important or not. So when we're doing the split, we usually would discuss what we saw. So I would say, hey, I noticed on page five, they were the NCO of the year. And then the panel member next to me would go, yeah, I totally missed that. I'll change my score. You know, or, hey, did you notice they had this referral EPR? No, nope, I didn't, I'll lower my score. You know, and these are just examples. These are not necessarily real conversations that we had. They're just examples. So that's how a split would work. Um, because we are reading the records fast and we are reading a lot of records and there is a chance um, that we could miss something. But the hope is that it doesn't get missed by all three people. And that if one person misses it, it will cause a split, which would then result in us discussing it and making sure that that member was graded fairly. Um, this is also an example of why we can't get away with scoring with our own personal biases. So if you work for me, and I think that you're amazing, and I really, really want you to get promoted, um, but maybe you have some really weak EPRs in the past, I can't just like sling you 10 points. Um, because the person next to me is going to not give you 10 points because your records don't earn 10 points. And then I'll have to defend why I gave you 10 points and end up probably having to change my score because I won't be able to appoint to enough things in the record to justify the 10 points. And I can't bring up the fact that I know you. So it's very, very important for your records to actually accurately reflect the caliber of work that you're doing. If you are truly the, the most amazing NCO, but you've never put any effort into writing your records and either of your supervisors, they know you're amazing, but they just didn't put any effort into your records. It isn't gonna translate onto paper. It has to translate onto paper. And you, you have partial control over that. Um, I know you're not writing your own EPRs, but you have control over input. Um, so anyway, on the first day, second day, we did training sessions. So we would sit together and we would grade. Um, usually they were old records. They were people that were not eligible for promotion, but they were real records. Um, so we would grade them and then discuss them. And so this was sort of like a norming phase where we learned the craft. We learned how to do it. We did this for, for days. Uh, in, in order to make sure that by the time that we started grading real records, we were ready. We weren't learning on your records. We had already learned how to do them. And we were allowed to discuss at that point in time. Um, we talked about things like techniques. Um, hey, what are you reading first? You know, how, how are, are you going backwards in chronology? Are you going forwards in chronology? We just kind of talked about best practices and how we could attack this. Um, thousands of records that we had to grade. Um, I did already talk about the split resolution, and so that that's just kind of neat. You know you're protected from any one board member um, tanking your promotion or any one board member um, helping somebody else to get a leg up on you. After we do the scoring, uh, you're, you're essentially put into groups. So everybody that gets 27 points, which would be three nines, um, everybody that gets 27 points is in one group, um, and then so on and so forth. So they're in the middle. You can see four people got 27s, eight people got 26 and a half, so on and so forth. So this particular AFSC had 39 promotions. And the way that the math worked out um, is there was this clean cut line um, that said exactly, well, that doesn't add up to 39, but anyway, there was this clean cut where basically 25 and a half points and up all got promoted. Sometimes there's not a clean cut line. Sometimes you end up where the group here in the middle with 25 points between those blue lines, there's 44 people in that group and we really needed it to be only 39. So they give us the records back and they make us regrade them. Um, and we're, we're still grading them the same way. We still wanna be fair. We don't want anybody in that group to have an advantage or disadvantage. So we're grading them the same way. 
but it's a second look. And sometimes we would slow down and we would try to read a, um, more carefully and we're looking a lot more for those differentiators um, to try to create some spread in those 44 records so that we can end up with five more people getting promoted and, and the others not getting promoted type of thing to get to, get to the right number of promotions. Um, occasionally, you end up in a head-to-head -head where you've got two records and only one stripe left. And they would give us those two records back and we would have to determine through our scoring processes who is getting promoted and who is not getting promoted. And that was hard, y'all, because these are tied records. It means they're tied. They're neck and neck. They are right there. They're equally deserving of promotion, but you have to differentiate them. And you know that that's happened to you if you have a score, like if your board grouping is say, you know, 367 and you're above a half point or below a half point, if your score is a half point away from your board grouping, the normal board grouping, then you know that you were in it essentially in a gray is what they call this or a tiebreaker. So that means that you had a score and it went up five points or down five points because it was a tiebreaker. Um, and so in those cases, you don't know what the panel member is going to use for the tiebreaker. It could be any of those things from the whole airman. Um, so they might look at the records and go, you know what? These people are both equal scope and scale, equal job performance, but one has a degree and the other doesn't. Or one was in the five, six and one wasn't. Um, or one has a joint deck and one doesn't. Who, who knows? We don't know. But the panel member uses something from the board charge to differentiate those two records. And that's why all the details in your record are important because you never know if you're going to have a gray. I'm not sure if someone had a question. I thought I might've heard someone. No, okay, cool. All right, so promotion policy, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go on, but the 9% promotion came from vacancies, essentially. Um, so the Air Force Recruiting Service, um, we had a limited number of vacancies in our master sergeants and we had a lower promotion rate than the rest of the Air Force because we had so many master sergeants already. Um, so some master people are good. Question? I don't know if it's a question or a hot mic. Some people are going to have, some AFSCs are going to have a higher promotion rate than normal um, because maybe they're critically manned or it's an AFSC that the Air Force is plussing up. Um, but we are overmanned in master sergeants. And that's why you will see, you know, so many master sergeants right now in tier two, they're not able to be flight chiefs um, because we have too many master sergeants. So that's a little bit of why um, your promotion rate was low. Um, I'll, I'll talk some more detail about other reasons, but that's one of the reasons that they were low. Um, unfortunately, we're not, well, it's not unfortunate. It's good that we have good manning, um, but unfortunate for the people trying to get promoted, we don't have a critical shortage of master sergeants in recruiting. Um, but we might in the future, you never know. Um, everybody retires someday. Um, so hopefully those master sergeants will get promoted, um, but they may also retire or return to force. You never know. So just because it was low doesn't mean it will always be low. Um, it will possibly be low for the foreseeable future. Um, but I don't want you to lose hope because now you're getting some of the keys to how you can make sure that you're competitive. Um, I, again, I just want to reemphasize that I'm not allowed to discuss the specific board procedure. So if you want to send me a, your records for records review, I'll, I'll have some instructions for you that on that later. Um, but I will not be able to tell you as a board member, I would have given you eight points, you know, for example. Um, I will have to do your records review as a chief doing a records review, the same way that I would review your records if I had never sat on the board. Um, I can't do it from the lens of a board member. I can just do it from the lens of a chief. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then this is the screen that you'll see in Prada if you go to try to do your records review on yourself, if you wanna check your records yourself. Um, so you just literally just go um, to Prada. There's a link on the Air Force portal. You might be able to Google it. You can also get there through like AFPC Secure. Uh, so you want to go in there and you can look at your performance reports and your uh, decorations and you want to make sure that they're correct. Um, you want to actually open them and look at them. So you might have six EPRs in there and they're labeled 2017, 2018, 2019. You might open the 2019 EPR and realize that it's the 2018 EPR and so is the 2018 EPR. So you might have the same EPR in there twice, for example, and then a whole EPR missing. 
even though at first glance, it looks like everything is correct. Um, and it, it's fairly common to be missing a decoration. Um, so it's very easy for your squadron to present you a decoration, give you the puppy blue folder, pin it on your uniform and forget to submit it officially in the system to Prada. So just because you have a copy of the citation does not mean that it's in Prada, you have got to check. Um, so I would recommend highly that you all do that. So that's the end of the official board briefing. Uh, and now I just wanna talk a little bit about like Chief Rosnos to you, like what's, what's really happening here with these promotions. Um, so in, 20, in 2021, there were 24,000 eligible tech sergeants. This year, there were, 20, there were over 27,000 eligible check, tech sergeants. That doesn't maybe sound like a whole lot more, but it's, it's 2,500 more. So there's 2,500 more people that you have to have better records than them in order to get promoted. So, you know, that is a little bit of why it was so hard this year. This was the largest promotion board in the history of the Air Force. I don't mean the largest promotion board to master. I mean the largest promotion board ever for any rank, officer or enlisted, the largest promotion board in Air Force history. So that gives you an idea of how many tech surgeons we have right now. Our retention is actually pretty good. I know you might not feel like it's good because you still have normal recruiting goals. Um, but our retention is good. And our retention is really good in tech sergeants. Y'all are staying, you're not going anywhere. You are here to stay. And so there are more tech sergeants, there were more tech sergeants eligible than ever before um, with only 4,000 of them being selected. That means that we have as many tech sergeants remaining almost as we did eligible in 2021. So when we promote staff sergeants to tech sergeants, you can kind of see that that's gonna, that's gonna fluff back up and we're gonna have a lot of tech sergeants again next year. Um, so I, I just want you to have realistic expectations that um, it's probably gonna be a little bit of a tough year again next year, but I don't want you to despair um, because we're, we're gonna help you out on figuring out exactly how to capture what you're doing so that if you wanna get promoted, you can. And then you can see there were fewer stripes. So the amount of available stripes went down in combination with the amount of eligibles going up. Um, the Air Force is doing something called grade structure adjustments. Um, so essentially what we're doing is we wanna keep bringing in airmen. We want, and that's why you're not gonna see like your goals disappear. Uh, we wanna keep bringing in airmen and then they're gonna get promoted automatically through the months to senior airmen. And then we're gonna see the number of senior airmen increase from where it's at today. So we're going to see an increase in senior airmen and a decrease in every rank above senior airmen. So the goal is to have fewer chiefs, fewer seniors, fewer masters, fewer techs, fewer staffs, and to have some additional airmen to round out the Air Force. But we're still shrinking the Air Force overall. So not only are we shrinking the Air Force, but we're shrinking what percentage of the Air Force can be these higher ranks. Um, it's not terrible in, in a historical sense. So if you look at the bottom, you can see that from 2002 to today, staff sergeants and tech sergeants have been having a reduction in time in service. So people are making staff and tech a lot sooner than they ever have before. Um, so chances are you made staff and tech pretty fast. Um, and so this is sort of like a course correction. Um, so, so you can expect to potentially get to master a little slower. Um, because we're, we're slowing back down that progression through the ranks. Um, now, because we don't think that you're capable, it's not that at all. Um, some of it is budget and, and various other things that are so, in some ways outside of the control of the Air Force. Um, but I think it's fair for you to kind of know this just so you have a realistic expectation of what it looks like going forward. Um, I don't know if it'll be 9% or 14% or 18% or 8%. I don't know what percent it's gonna be next year. Um, but I don't think we're going to see it go from 9% to like 30% next year. Um, so it's, it's more important than ever that you make sure that your records really reflect the caliber of NCO that you are. Um, another question that I'm getting a lot um, is, you know, Chief Rosnos, I had a must promote, but I didn't get promoted. How could this happen? Um, so it, it does historically happen. Uh, in 2020, you can see there were a few hundred promote nows and must promotes that didn't get promoted. Um, in 2021, same thing. And in 2022, same thing. So it's normal. Um, in 2022, it was more than it has historically been. But I think that's because there were more eligibles. And when you have more eligibles, your 
um, amount of must promotes and promote nows that you can give out increases because it's a percentage of the eligibles. And then those who were promoted with promotes did go down because our number of promotions went down. But historically, you can get promoted with a promote. Um, I believe that recruiting service, uh, and I, I wish I had the numbers on the slide, but you can also get this on my purse. If you go into my purse and you type in 21E7, you can get all the stats. So um, don't quote me on this, but I think there were two recruiters that got promoted with a promote. Um, I think it was only two. So uh, while I'm saying it's possible, it's not super common in recruiting um, right now this year. But there were quite a few promote nows and must promotes that didn't get promoted. Um, so people have been concerned, you know, did, did I as a command staff or as a leadership staff, did I get it wrong? No, absolutely not. You did not get it wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying if you were a promote now or a must promote that, you know, your record didn't match. That's not what I'm saying necessarily. Um, what might have happened is a couple of promotes had such amazing stellar records that their records were good enough that it just leapfrogged your must promote or your promote now. Um, and then another reason is that 15% of you can get a must promote or promote now, but only 9% of you can get promoted. So automatically a good percentage of you with must promotes and promote nows can't get promoted because there aren't enough promotions for you to all get promoted. Uh, and unfortunately that's just the way the math worked out this year. Um, so it was it was bound to happen. Some promotes and, and must promote nows and must promotes were not going to get promoted. Um, you can you can hedge your bets um, on whether or not you're going to get promoted with a must promote or promote now if everything else is correct in your records. Um, you know, so for example, when your squadron does your EFDP, they might not see an Article 15 that happened at your last unit because when the shirt is doing a QFR, the the quality force review they're usually only looking at your PIP from that unit. So there's a chance that a squadron leadership could miss an Article 15 at an old unit and the board is gonna see the Article 15. We don't just know that you had an Article 15, we see it, we read it, we know the details of what you did. Um, so that is something that might factor in to your board score being a little lower than you expected when you had a must promote or promote now. Um, another factor is that the EFTP only uses three EPRs and the promotion board, as we talked about, looks at five years, so five or six EPRs. So perhaps somebody's top three EPRs are just amazing and that's how they got a must promote or promote now, but they didn't figure it out until three years ago. So the three EPRs before that are super average, not saying they're bad, they're just average. Maybe the person next to you had six years of amazing EPRs. And those six years of amazing EPRs might for that particular panel member or that particular board member um, have outweighed three average EPRs in a must promote. Um, so those are just things that might be happening. I'm not saying they're happening. I didn't, I don't know who with must promote didn't get promoted. I didn't go back and look at the records to see why. Um, these are just sort of my theories of, of what might be happening when this is the result that you're seeing. Um, the other thing that I think likely happens is that you save your records on your desktop, right? You've got your record of performance file on your desktop. It's that PDF that you have with all your records in it. Um, and when your squadron leadership says, hey, give us your record of performance for the EFDP and you shoot it to them in an email, you're not realizing that the records you have on your desktop don't match what's in Prada. And so the board in the EFDP might be looking at different records. Um, you might've given decorations to the EFDP that the board never saw because they weren't in Prada. So things like that could be happening. Um, so these are some good, some good things to think about if anyone comes to you with that, hey, I had a must promote, I didn't get promoted um, question. Um, some common mistakes that I've seen, not talking about the promotion board, just talking about in the records that people have sent to me for, for records reviews. Um, sometimes I know that, like we mentioned before, someone has a large award or a PME award in their past. They tell me about it. I know they have it, but it's not in their decoration. So no one will ever know about it. Um, and, and that may be something that impacts your career trajectory. Um, job descriptions that don't show scope and scale. So you all compete against each other if you're 8Rs. So every 8R 
is responsible for managing their DAP. Every single AR tier one is responsible for exactly the same things. So if all your job descriptions look exactly the same, there's nothing to differentiate who should get promoted and who shouldn't. So in your job descriptions, if there are things that are unique about your scope and scale, tell me that. Um, tell me about how you have the largest AOR in your whole squadron, the most schools in your whole squadron, uh, whatever it is. If you have something that means that you are uniquely experienced, make sure that you capture that in your duty description. Um, if you were the NCOIC or a superintendent, like prior to being in ADAR, for example, you were the NCOIC of something in maintenance. Um, as the NCOIC, what I'm expecting to see is that you had people that you took care of and people that you developed and people that you put in for awards and people that you inspired. Um, and I don't often see that. I often see I was the NCOIC in charge of 33 people. And then I see all these bullets that are just about what I did. And I don't see anything about your 33 people and how you led them or developed them. Um, so that doesn't necessarily help you um, to prove to me that you are ready to be a senior NCO. Um, and then repeating information on EPRs. This is something that I see a lot of in recruiting. Um, again, through records reviews, not necessarily the promotion board. Um, I looked at a record yesterday that had a, a, a bullet that was about H2F, hard to fill. Nobody outside of recruiting knows what H2F is, but H2F. Um, AFSCs, and then it was like some SW and a whole bunch of other AFSCs. And then that same EPR, two bullets later, it had an SW bullet. So you told me twice about SW. And then I see sometimes where you're like, I had one can in the, you know, I had no cans in the first quarter, no cans in the second quarter, one can in the third quarter, and no cans in the fourth quarter. And then I see another bullet that goes, only one can all year. Well, yeah, I know it was only one can all year because I could add. You already told me about all the quarters. I don't need you to also tell me about the year. Um, so think about that. Are you repeating information on your EPR? If you're repeating information, you didn't look at your EPR as a whole. And I start to question, did you maybe not have enough to fill up your EPR? So you had to take like your can rate and you had to make five bullets out of it. I, I don't know. I don't know what you were doing with, with repeating information on your EPR. Um, so I think a lot of times when we're writing our EPRs, we tend to focus on each individual bullet and we don't look at it as a whole. So really look at your bullet as a whole uh, or your EPR as a whole. Um, I and me focus bullets are not gonna get you into senior NCO ranks um, with, with hard low promotion rates. And what I mean by I and me focus bullets, those bullets where you're just focusing on yourself. Um, and I've got some examples later, it'll make a lot more sense when you see the examples, but um, I don't want to hear about what you did for yourself. I want you to hear about what you did for the squadron and for the group and for the other people below you. I wanna know that you're gonna bring people with you, that you're gonna inspire people, that you're gonna develop people. I wanna know that you can be a master sergeant. Um, you have to talk about recruiting if you're a recruiter, you have to. Um, but if all, the only trick you have up your sleeve is production, then I don't know if you can be a master sergeant. I just know you can be a, a darn good recruiter. So you have got to stop convincing the board that you are good at recruiting and you have got to start convincing the board that you are good at leadership. Um, and so we tend to focus so much on our fiscal year 1206s, which are all about production, um, that I think we forget that the message we send with our EPRs has to be different than that. It has to be about NCO ship, airmanship, leadership, senior NCO responsibilities. It has to be about all of those things if you wanna to try to get into that 9% that's getting promoted. Um, and then again, be careful with that AFSC speak because you don't know who is going to need to interpret your EPRs. Um, the board charge, that thing that I was talking about that tells the board exactly how they're supposed to grade your records. Um, these are the big rocks out of the board charge. Um, so it says we're going to use the whole airman concept. We have to consider um, job performance and job responsibility. So this is where the tier one recruiters do have a little bit of a disadvantage. So there is no conspiracy in AFRS to say, don't promote tier one recruiters. We, we, we don't want them to make master. Um, we just want the tier two plus recruiters to make master. Um, remember, it's not recruiters on your promotion board. They don't know what tiers are. They don't know what a tier one or a tier two or a tier three is. It's not a thing. There's not this tier conspiracy. We're not holding you back as tier one. Um, but the fact is that as tier one, you have less responsibility than in tier two. I'm not saying you don't work harder or that it's not a harder job. It is very difficult job in tier one recruiting that I don't want to say difficult like that, but 
It's a job that we know how much blood, sweat, and tears that you put into it. We know how hard you work. We know that it takes an immense amount of skills. Um, but generally what you're writing about is how I made goal. I didn't have a lot of cans. Um, I didn't have a lot of rels. I had a high success rate. I found two linguists. You're generally writing that. And what your tier two recruiters are sometimes writing is I, it's still an I, but I, you know, I trained 60 recruiters. Um, I mentored nine flight chiefs. I tracked the squadron's production. You start to see things that are more out, that are about more people and that are about more programs that have a higher level of responsibility. So that is a factor. As tier, if you're a tier one recruiter, you have opportunities to do that. They're not as easy to find, but they're there. Uh, when your squadron is looking for someone to brief at the tri flights, or you know you have an awesome skill that's really making you rock production, share that skill with others and capture that you developed those others. Um, so there are ways that you can do this even as a tier one recruiter, but it, it's it's a little more difficult. Um, so that is why you may see higher promotions in those higher tiers. It's not because you can't get promoted as a tier one recruiter. It's just that you've got to be thoughtful in how you capture your accomplishments. Um, Chief of Staff of the Air Force writes to the board that it is imperative that you score records based on proven leadership. Um, and so that's the thing that you wanna be writing your bullets on. If you are managing a national asset at an air show and you talk about how you coordinated the national asset, that's cool. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. That's a great bullet. Um, but if you um, had four other recruiters come and help you um, and you helped schedule, you know, decide what schedule people were going to be working and you coordinated the DAP and you coordinated the Thunderbirds. I want you to tell me about that. I want you to tell me about how you led a team of four recruiters and 30 DAP through the execution of, of running this national asset booth. Um, so focusing more on I, I coordinated and led with people. That's that type of leadership. And you still do have an opportunity to do that as a tier one recruiter. Um, and you can do it in other ways too. You can do it through leadership positions in the five, six. Um, you can do it through planning committees on the annual awards, squadron booster clubs, all of these things, they double, right? Now they're a whole airman bullet, but they also show leadership. Um, so just because you don't directly supervise anyone, if you're a tier recru one recruiter, it doesn't mean you can't do these things. Um, the, the board charge says that the Air Force wants you to develop as leaders, supervisors, managers, and mentors, ensuring your airmen are trained. Um, if you're a tier one recruiter, you don't have airmen, but you have deppers and you train them. So I don't just want to see in your job description that you, you know, you manage your dep. I want you to tell me, how did you do that? Um, don't just tell me I held a monthly dep call. Cool. That's met expectations. You're required to do that. Do something above and beyond. Get those deppers ready for basic training. Teach them something. And then tell me that you taught them that and how it impacted their grad rate or the honor grad rate, something like that. So you have absolutely have chances to capture this type of leadership to prove to me that you are ready for more leadership. Um, this says that recruiters are responsible for pursuing, or not recruiters, tech sergeants are responsible for, for pursuing professional development. It's right in the board charge. You're responsible for doing that. If I look at your six EPRs and I don't see any professional development, well, you didn't meet your responsibilities. So that may or may not impact your board score, but it, it's literally in the board charge. You got to do it. Uh, education says that this is going to be assessed in terms of how it impacts the mission or your ability to serve in the next higher grade. And I've got some examples of that um, coming up in a minute, but it's not just checking a box. It's what did you do with your education once you checked that box? Um, this, this one here, um, Joint Coalition Nation Building Broader Cultural Awareness, Global Operating Capabilities. I'm not sure if you've heard about diversity lately, uh, but it's, it's kind of a big thing right now in the Air Force. And so you might not be on a diversity council or anything like that, but you are still doing this. I am certain of it. And if you're not, you can. So maybe at your next DEP call, you want to teach your DEPers about um, Diversity in the Air Force. Maybe you are, are in a zone where there is no diversity and you're not going to be able to have a bullet about how you recruited diverse applicants. But if you're in that zone where there's no diversity, then your applicants might have never been exposed to diversity and they're going to get to basic training and it's going to blow their mind. So maybe you hold a 
in one of your dev calls, this is a topic that you talk about. You talk about what are the Air Force's um, anti-discrimination policies. You tell them about what EO is. Um, you talk about various different initiatives that the Air Force has for equality and inclusion. And then you've got a bullet about how you develop these future airmen to be culturally aware so that they're better citizens in the Air Force and you did it in accordance with Chief of Staff of the Air Force priorities. Um, and this is something that now, rather than just saying I had depth calls like I was supposed to, you're telling me that you understand what your senior leaders want from you and you're telling me how you actioned it. Um, so that stuff is very important for you to start to think this way. You've got to transition your thoughts to align with the board charge. Um, and then it talks a little bit about deployments. You've either got them or you don't. It's not a pass fail. Um, the promotion statement. It says that these recommendations provide insights into where the command or where the airman stands amongst their peers within the commander's purview. It doesn't say put a lot of weight on them or put a little weight on them, but it says, you know, these provide significant insight. So they matter. It's clear in the board charge that they matter. Um, but it's clear from the statistics I showed you earlier that they're not pass fails either. Um, you need to be able to understand um, all these words here, Air Force core competencies, institutional competencies, distinctive capabilities. You might not even know what any of this is. Um, take a screenshot and Google it and get smart on it and write EPR bullets that show us that you are in tune with the culture of the Air Force and the priorities of the Air Force. Um, and then it says, look for indications of developing self and others. So we already had before where it said you're responsible for professional development. Now it's saying it again. Um, so if I were you, I'd probably have a bullet about how you're doing that on your EPR. Um, so here's some examples of bullets. It's just two, I'm not gonna you know, go over tons of bullets with you guys because I'm, I'm already busting my time. But um, the first bullet ensured 100% AF win rate. So let's think about that first part of your bullet. Does a maintenance colonel know what AFWIN is? They probably don't. And even if you define it in your acronyms, they still don't know what it is and they still don't understand why it matters. Um, 30 of 30 DEP took the test, cool. If we're recruiters, we know that you're supposed to have 100% um, AFWIN rate. It's also repetitive. 30 of 30 is 100%. You didn't need to say 100% and 30 of 30. You're repeating stuff, no need to do that. Um, in the second bullet, we're saying train squadron. So now you're really great at the AFWIN rate. And maybe you talked for five minutes at the, at the tri-flight or the semi-annual about how you're so good at AFWIN and the rest of your squadron was able to now also get to 100%. So you trained your squadron on how to adapt personality testing because people know what that is and they don't know what AFWIN is. Um, you ensured now that all the squadron stuff, all 800 of these future airmen, instead of DEPRs or future airmen, were vectored to the right AFSC. Because if I'm a security forces commander, now this means something to me. I understand now that instead of sending me a bunch of people who don't want to be defenders, you're going to send me people who want to do it and they're good fits. And that's important to me. And then this increased the, the grad rate and it was in alignment with Chief of Staff of the Air Force's action orders. This is almost the same bullet, but it is gonna hit totally differently when someone is deciding if you should get promoted or not. Um, and I don't know if you've read Chief of Staff of the Air Force's action orders. If you haven't, please Google it. I know I'm giving you a lot of homework, but please Google it. It's a 12 page document, it's only 12 pages. And an entire page is about talent management and recruiting. Um, and so it's like almost 10% of the chief of staff's action orders are about talent management in recruiting. So this should be in every single one of your EPRs. It doesn't have to be AFWIN, but it should be in your EPRs some way. And then this next bullet, um, took three classes, some I did, earned nine credits, some I did. I was named to the honor society, I got a 4.0. So this bullet is just about me, 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 and, and about how great I am. It's not a bad bullet. It still shows me that you got your education. It's still a click mark on that board score. But the second one says you improved the unit, ACE nine credits, taught enlisted force structure, and then you developed NCOs to also take college classes. So now you're developing others. You've got some leadership. And this thing here, this improved the unit, I hope some of you recognize that as an ALQ. Um, so you might not have, um, be super familiar with ALQs and MGAs, but you should be because the Air Force has been talking about them for a year. 
Um, and that new thing, that FSS, my FSS that you all love so much, um, that new feedback form that you got, that's the ALQs. So the Air Force has been messaging ALQs and MGAs so hard for the last year that if we are listening at all, we understand that these are priorities of the Air Force. Um, I don't know this for a fact, but I have a sneaking suspicion that ALQs and MGAs are gonna be in the next board charge. So you probably wanna weave them in somewhere in your EPR to show that you're listening and that you are in lockstep with your senior leaders um, and that you should be a leader too. So give me the next strike because I'm listening. So, so think about how you can weave those into your EPRs. Um, I'm almost done y'all. Um, so please check your records early and often. Um, print that board charge. Literally, when you draft your EPR, print the board charge. Um, I want you to take that board charge and I want you to read the first paragraph. And then I want you to ask yourself, what bullet on my EPR answers this paragraph in the board charge? And if you don't have a bullet that answers that paragraph in your board charge, you need new bullets. Um, so really, really, really use that board charge. It's the, it's the roadmap. And then start internalizing ALQs and MGAs. Again, if you don't know what they are, go Google them. There's a thousand news articles. Um, use the enlisted force structure and use the action orders. Do those things on your EPR and you've got a chance at getting promoted. Um, I will share with you um, that I made senior my while I was a flight chief without a strap. And I don't know if that's bragging or not because sometimes you know, people might think, well, you didn't have a strap, so maybe you weren't that great. Uh, so I don't, I don't mean it to come off as bragging. Um, but I made senior as a flight chief without a strat because I did this. It works. So I didn't have the strat, and I was in the tier where everyone said I couldn't make senior. But I knew better than that because I knew if I used the board charge to write my EPRs and no one else was using the board charge to write their EPRs, that I'd get promoted. And it did work. And then I made chief my first time with no strat because I did it again, because the people around me weren't doing it. You have got to use the board charge. That board charge is more powerful than a promotion statement. Those promotes that got promoted without a must promote or promote out, they probably use the board charge. Um, so please, 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 please go download the board charge and use it. Um, and again, you heard, it, you heard it here first, but I think those ALQs and MGAs are gonna be in the next board charge. Um, when you look at your EPRs, go to Prada and download your EPRs. And then ask yourself, is the board going to be able to see my education level? And does it match what the enlisted force structure says it should match? Don't just think that you have your bachelor's degree and so it's going to be obvious. Scrub your EPRs and see, is it obvious? Um, can you see in your EPRs where you have mentored others? Can you see it in your last EPR where you've mentored others? Um, did you do nothing in whole airmen so you had to put recruiting bullets there? Um, that could be noticed by people who are reviewing your records. Um, is your, are your EPRs above or below average? Are the bullet impacts at your level or higher levels? Do you have awards? You don't have to have awards. I'm not saying you have to have awards, um, but when it's a 9% promotion rate and your competition has awards, it doesn't hurt to have those awards. So pull your own records, look at them, and give yourself an honest assessment of your records. Um, don't sit there and think, I've worked my butt off for the last five years. I know that I'm awesome, and so I don't understand why I got promoted. You probably did work your butt off, and you probably are awesome, but does it read that way in your records? Go look at your records. You probably don't even need me to do a records review if you do that for yourself, but if you want me to do a records review, um, this is what I need you to send me, three to six EPRs, all your decorations. I do not want your PT score sheet and I do not want any cover letter cheat sheets. Um, I want it in one PDF um, where I can highlight and type, type, type notes on it for you. So that way you've got that forever that you can look at those notes. Um, I cannot do that if you have live signatures on your records. So I want you to print them to a Microsoft PDF and combine them, not in Adobe, but a Microsoft PDF. That's how you do that. So you download it from Prada, print it to Microsoft PDF, and then you can combine them. Um, I will caution that I can't say, as a board member, I would have graded you this way. I'm gonna do the records review as a chief, not as a board member. Um, tomorrow is my last day at work for the next three weeks. So if you send me your records, just know I'm not gonna get them back to you by Monday. 
Um, and I, I have quite a few in my inbox. So you're gonna have to be really, really patient with me. Um, I'm gonna try to prioritize the master sergeant records reviews because their Scott is next. Um, so again, just be patient with me. Um, but if you want, you can send me your records. Um, you don't have to though, because now I think you have enough that you could do your own records review. Um, all right, I'm sorry I went over. That's literally all that I have. So um, I am prepared to take questions for those of you that have hung with me this long. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna dip through the uh, chat just real quick to see if there are any questions. Oh, yep. The um, I see there's a question about if you're able to see that DVB, that board brief that the board sees. Yes, it should be in Prada. There should be a folder that says like board brief or as met, and you can see it that way. Um, alternatively, in the virtual MPF, you can pull something called a DVB. Um, it is different than a SERP, and that one's not all the way sanitized. Um, but if you've met a promotion board, your ASMET records would be in Prada, and you can see the DVB. So that that should be should be pretty easy. All right. Any other questions? I guess that I don't see. Any. Uh, yes. Hello, ma'am. Hi. I can hear you. I'm not sure who it is. Yes, ma'am. It says uh, Sergeant Reynaldo Press, Santiago, OE recruiter in Puerto Rico. Uh, oh, three, hi. Three, four seconds. Um, hello, hello. Uh, great briefing. Uh, I just had a, a quick question. Maybe you, maybe I missed it, but like uh, in terms of the, the back of the EPR, right? I always hear that that's like, that's obviously like the most important from that, from that one EPR is the back. So for, for those bullets, I'm trying to think how to ask this question, but like, uh, like we know obviously okay like recruiting yes that's important like how well you did in, in terms of numbers and all that stuff but would you also recommend like internal and external mentorship bullets to be in the back as well like would that be the place to put those at if that makes sense <laughs> it does make sense um so i would put i would always try to put your strongest bullets on the back and what's strong is gonna be different for different people. So for someone, they might have had the most insanely amazing production ever that that is a really strong bullet on the back of their EPR if the bullet's written correctly. Um, for others, it might be that they, uh, with diversity, those of you that um, know, for example, there's, there's this whole other thing called a BOG. It's like a barrier analysis working group. Um, and I have some recruiters that have worked with the BOGS and it has changed our entire diversity numbers for our squadron. We, we work with some specific um, Air Force BOGS and anyway, there, there was this crazy amount of really cool stuff that happened. So for that recruiter, that's probably their strongest bullet. Um, and also it's something really unique that not a lot of recruiters were doing. Um, so that's one of the things that I would think about when I look when I look at what's on the back of the EPR. Read the bullet and ask yourself: Is this a bullet that a whole lot of other recruiters are going to have as well? Um, because there's going to be a whole lot of recruiters who have decent success rates at maps. There's going to be a whole lot of recruiters that have silver badges. I'm not you can still put a silver badge on the back, but what I'm saying is that in and of itself is not just like amazing because so many people get them. Um, so if you have something that's unique, that sets you apart, that is like definitely not going to be on every 8R EPR, I would put that on the back. If you've had some kind of an Air Force um, or AFRS level impact, like maybe you were on a, a, a unique Tiger team or something like that, put that on the back. Um, so I would put the thing on the back that is like uniquely yours, that other people aren't going to also have the same bullet that has a large impact or that has a heavy hitting award. Um, if you don't have any of those things, then still just look through your EPR and think about which one of these really sells me as a leader. Um, that's what I would, I would consider putting on the back of your EPR, but it's gonna probably be a little bit different for every individual. Copy that, thank you, ma'am, I appreciate it. I hope that helps a little. Absolutely. Cool. All right, any other questions? Hey, Chief. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Fantastic. So I'm Sergeant Bilby. I'm actually up at headquarters. Um, I'm not a recruiter. I'm actually a one Delta seven. Okay. Um, so this is actually going to be kind of a weird question. It may apply to people in the future, but not necessarily right now. So I just came out of a green door assignment. Okay. 
Um, so I look at my last four EPRs as somebody that's not in that world. It's a, they seem watered down because 99.9% of what I did or the organization did or accomplished is SCI'd. Okay. So there'll be some clues um, on your data verification brief. Uh, it's going to be partially redacted and data masked. Um, and so there will be clues um, that a, I would believe a chief or a colonel would be able to read those clues. Um, so when you start seeing things that are redacted or data masked, it gives a good clue that you were in a green door assignment. So I, I can usually tell by looking at someone's records, they were in a green door assignment. Um, and without looking at the specific bullets, it would be hard for me to tell. Um, but if you were leading people, that part wouldn't have had to be watered down. It would still be, you know, led team through and then that kind of sanitized version of whatever you led them through. Um, so that part doesn't change. The importance of leadership in teams and people doesn't change. Um, but I wouldn't stress about it because I believe the people on the board are smart enough to figure out that it was a green door um, and what that means, because it's even the DBB, it's going to be like the base is going to be data masked. All this stuff's going to be data masked. So we'll, we'll know. We'll get it. Okay. Cool. That helps. Um, there's a lot of you on, so I'll, I'll just hang out. Um, if you don't have any questions, you can drop off. But if you have questions, I'll hang out. And you can also shoot me an email or a text if you have questions that you don't necessarily want to ask in the forum. Um, but for everybody that came, I really think, thank you for your time. I know taking an hour plus from you at the end of the day is a big ask in these in these busy times, but I, I know I speak for all the chiefs in recruiting service that we um, are so happy that you're on the team. We are so thankful for the hard work that you're doing. And we would wanna see every single one of you get promoted if we could. Um, unfortunately, there just aren't enough vacancies right now. So um, don't give up hope though. If, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're documenting it the way that you should be documenting, it will come. I can't promise you that's gonna come the very next promotion board, but it'll come. Would that right, be a, so just, uh, oh, a certain segment? Would that be a copy of this PowerPoint sent out, or at very least the last the last slide? Yes, I can send that last slide out. I don't know if we have a well. Yes, I'll I'll get it sent out. I'll get it over to the the five six team, and they can send it out. I'll place my email in the chat if that helps. Oh, perfect. Yep, I can get that to you. And if you, if you want a records review and, and for some reason you don't get the email with the slides, just shoot me a message and say, hey, Chief, what do you need again for that records review? And I'll, I'll answer you. I'm pretty good at answering emails. Not always going to be a same day answer, but I'm pretty good at it. I had a lot okay. of practice with tier one. Awesome. Thank you, Chief. Definitely. Thank you. Cool. Hey, thank you so much, Chief. Uh, this has just been... Phenomenal. What a phenomenal and knowledgeable brief. You know, I had some questions, but um, you covered most of them. So I really thank you for that. Uh, it was really eye opening. So, you know, oh, thank I think, you. Uh, yeah, I think um, it was extremely beneficial. And I just, I can't thank you enough on behalf of the five six. And um, I don't know, Sergeant. Uh, Nixon, did you did you want to say anything before we wrap up? He might have dropped off. Ah, uh, okay. Our Sergeant Smith, are you still there? Yes, ma'am, I am here. <clears throat> um, nothing personally to pass on. I know we're going to have some new faces here to the five six here within the next week, so we'll have a a smooth transition turnover and making sure these new members are up to speed and. Uh, have contacts moving forward. And just to add about uh, the slides, I will be posting this uh, meeting today on our 5-6 channel uh, on YouTube. Um, so it will be available for viewing um, and I'll make sure a link is sent out on our socials as well. Cool. All right, well, thank you everybody. And I hope you all have a great 4th of July. Thank you, you too, Chief. Thank you.